Well, so today we're coming to the end of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Uh, this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Um, he, a real person with real experiences and with a very meaningful and significant relationship pastorally and also as somebody that walked with this church in Ephesus for several years. He wrote them this letter, and we're coming to the end of a chapter in which he's at a place of gratitude and thankfulness. And so what we want to do today is we're going to see what he chose to do. And yes, like Kenneth, he chose to pray. Okay, but we're going to see what he prayed, we're going to see why he prayed, and we're going to see how then that calls us to maybe have a higher set of expectations for both the, the place of God as he works in our lives that leads us to experience thankfulness, but then also how we can think outside of maybe our immediate surroundings of when we are thankful. That it's not just, oh, I'm thankful for this that God gave me, or I'm thankful for that that I achieved, or I'm thankful for this. But there are greater and grander things for which every follower of Jesus can be very thankful for. And if you're not a Christian today, there's many things for which if you're a follower of Jesus, we can be thankful for. And a life of gratitude is one that is very different from one of bitterness. A life of prayerfulness and dependence is different from one of having to wrestle and fight and struggle for everything on your own. And if you're in Christ, then you are in that life, in that trajectory of being thankful. And how you respond is what we're going to look at today. So let's go ahead and pray. Our Father, we thank you so much, God, for this time that we have today. We thank you, Lord, for all those that finished their finals this week. God, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in their lives. We thank you, God, that they can look ahead to a summer in which they can continue to walk with you and, and be a part of this church family together. We Thank you, Lord, for those that are about to finish their finals in the next couple weeks. Uh, and we also thank you, Lord, for those that are going to graduate. God, all of this uh, is possible, Lord, because you are kind and gracious to us. Not in just these ways, but when these things happen, we know you were behind it all. And so, God, we pray, Lord, that we would look into the heart, Lord, and the mind of the Apostle Paul today as he addresses the Ephesians, as he's coming from a place of gratitude himself, a, a place in which we can see that the joy and the emotions coming through him because of what he's seen you do in their midst. And we thank you, Lord, that through today's text, in Ephesians 1, we're also able to see how he gave thanks, what he gave thanks for, and how then we're able to see you at work, both in this life, both in the present time, but also in greater ways with a future hope of what is to come in Christ. So God, we pray, Lord, that you would just open up our hearts today, God, and, and help us just to hear what your word has to say, and we also pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will cause a heart, Lord, of gratitude among us, God, that would call, it, call us then to respond. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we've gone through the last few sermons in Ephesians 1, going through this beginning half in which Paul is sharing about how God has given all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places to his children who are in Christ. And so the way in which these blessings come is because before the foundations of the world, God had ordained to create a people for himself, and that group of people was adopted into his family through Jesus Christ. And so when people came to faith in what Jesus did on the cross, died for their sins, we just celebrated this on Easter, and then he was raised <laughs> from the dead, those that put their faith in Jesus in that way, God adopts into his family. And Jesus is faithful but not only is Jesus faithful and mighty in saving sinners and keeping them, the Holy Spirit is given to God's people as a promise and a seal that those who are following Jesus through the ups and downs of life will continue to follow Jesus. Yes, we will often stumble. Yes, we will often fail. Yes, we will often screw up and sin. But the Holy Spirit, if he is in us, he's the one that gave us a new heart and he will seal all of these promises and blessings of God all the way until the end. And so we come to verse 14 of chapter 1, and that's where we're at, is where we see that God's people have been saved and protected and prepared for heaven, for eternity, for forever. And so he's excited about this. These are spiritual blessings that he sees, that there is nothing greater that this world has to offer or any spiritual being or anyone else that has to offer more than what God has already planned, ordained, and delivered. And then that's what brings us then to verses 15 to 23, which is today's passage. So I'm going to start reading from verse 15 and just, uh, here we go, uh, verses 15 and the first half of 16 to get us started here, to see 
where Paul is coming from and why he has something to give thanks for. So verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So when you see the words for this reason, you're thinking, well, what is this for? Well, if you just look back a couple of verses, Paul talks about this gospel that when people believe, the Holy Spirit seals them, right? But then Paul is the messenger of this gospel. So Paul is the one that went to Ephesus and said, hey, these are God's promises. This is God's blessing in Christ. This is what it means to be a part of his family adopted as heirs. This is what it means to be redeemed saints. Repent and believe in Jesus, Ephesians. And they did. They did. And they didn't only do this in their minds only, because you see in verse 15, their faith is in the Lord, so they've trusted in Jesus, so they find themselves in God's family and in God's promises. But what else do they show? In the second half of 15, their love toward all the saints. So this tells a couple of things. One is that their faith was not just head knowledge. That their faith is actually changing them to love people that they maybe would not have loved people before. And we will see this in chapter 2, in that the church in Ephesus was a breaking down of social and cultural barriers so that the church, one people, was consisting of Jewish and Gentile believers. They shouldn't get along, but they did. And Paul just says they loved each other. And that is what gave him thanks, that they trusted in the gospel. They believed in this gospel, and then it shows. It's changing their lives. In order to love the saints, it means that they are walking with the saints, that they are worshiping with each other, they're eating with each other, they're praying with each other, they are helping each other, they're caring for each other. That's what it means to love the saints. And when the guys, we have five guys that joined our church a couple weeks ago on Easter through baptism, that's what they're committing to do, that they're going to join the FCBC Walnut Church family so that they can love the saints. Not just talk about it, not just say, oh, yeah, 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 God is love and that's great. But we're going to commit to a church family and love the saints, all the saints, older saints, younger saints, newer saints, seasoned saints, mature saints, still growing saints. We're going to love the saints. That's what it means to be a member of a church. And so he's totally thankful, right? He's really excited because there's nothing more exciting than when your life mission is being fulfilled and demonstrated in front of your face. If your goal was to design a rocket that went to Mars and it succeeded, you'd be so excited because that's what you were living and breathing. Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was called to go to these outlying cities to start churches and to preach the gospel. And there's nothing greater than for him to see that in the city of Ephesus, this is taking root. This is changing lives. This gospel is true. This mission is worth it. Paul could not be any more excited. And then, just like Kenneth, when Paul is thankful, what did he do? Second half of verse 16, remembering you in my prayers. You know what? I, I look out at you guys, I think of my own heart. I, I think we're... I think we would pray. If we're thankful for something, we would pray. Right? That doesn't seem too strange. It doesn't seem like something you have to twist your arm to do. But I wonder how we pray, and I wonder what we pray for when we are thankful. And that's where I want to look at, then, what Paul is saying. Because he's going to tell us real quick, what is he praying for? And then the rest of the passage is unpacking, okay, if God answers this request... It will happen in these three ways that people will understand. And building upon the promises here, we're going to see that this is able to be fulfilled because Jesus is that powerful king that delivers. Okay, So that's what we'll see in the rest of this passage here. So let's go ahead and see real quick what Paul prays for, starting from verse 17 of chapter 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ... The Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, 
having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Do you guys ever pay for that kind of stuff? <laughs> maybe, maybe not as often, right? Interesting, then, what is he praying for? He's not praying for a thing. He's not praying for information. He's praying for a person. And he's praying for a person to do a thing. He's not just praying for the thing itself. Like, if you get an A in a class, maybe our Thanksgiving prayer would, would be, Dear God, thank you for the A in the class. Right? That's not what he's praying for. He's not saying, Dear God, thank you for the faith of the Ephesians. Give them more of that. Help them to do that. He didn't pray for that. He prayed for a person. And it's interesting who he addresses. He addresses the Father of glory. And if you see that passage, verses 3 through 14, that set up the spiritual blessings, everything that God did in, in creating the world and in saving the people and in, in sealing the people and adopting the people, that was for his glory. And so right off the top, Paul wants God to have glory, which is the purpose of why God did everything. God did things for his glory. Now, are you thinking God is a little selfish? Yes, God is selfish, but God is the only one that can be selfish. See, usually when we're selfish is because we want something that someone else has. So it's for a negative reason. We want something that someone else can lose that we can have for ourselves. Okay, whether it's attention, whether it's status, whether it's stuff, it's like, no, that person shouldn't have it. I want it. But what is the greatest good? What is the source of ultimate glory? And we see this earlier in chapter one. It's the father of glory. So when God wants glory for himself, it is the glorious being pointing to himself and telling you guys, here, you want me because anything else you get is inferior. So when I'm being glorified, you guys will be blessed because I'm the best thing there is in the universe. So God is the only one that could be selfish because God would be selfish the bad way if he wasn't selfish. He'd be settling for less. The rest of us, we settle for less when we're selfish. Or we want to take away something from others. But when God is selfish, he brings glory to himself. And everyone sees that glory. And everyone is blessed. And everyone is changed. And so he's petitioning to the Father of glory who created all of this, who set the plan of salvation into motion, who will keep his children forever into eternity. And then he asks for the Holy Spirit to come into the picture and to give wisdom. Thinking back again to taking finals, if you're praying, maybe you'd be praying, dear God, please help me to study hard enough on my finals and to recall what I barely study so that I can have the right information and the right answers on the test. You'd be asking for the information. If Paul was to pray that prayer, what would he have said? He would have said, dear God, not you skip the Holy Spirit part, please give your people more knowledge. Please give your people more wisdom. He prays for God to give his people a relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, God is relational. The Trinity is a holy community. So to know and to be like God, to give glory to God, would be because the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, working in your life, conforming and changing you, rooting out sin, convicting you of how you should live for God, and then enabling you to obey God's law as it is written in your heart. So see, he could pray for more knowledge, he could pray for more wisdom, but he prays for a greater presence and experience and relationship with the Holy Spirit, who is God, so that they will continue to love God and to love neighbor, as Paul was giving thanks for in verse 15. 
It's interesting how it says, have your light eyes enlightened. You know, it's probably a, a passage like this from which the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, comes from. You know your heart doesn't have eyes, but open the eyes of my heart is, is what, who you are in your soul and what you can imagine and what you can understand about life, about God, about reality. Opening the eyes of your heart instead of having a heart that is hard, a heart that is blind, or a heart that is ignorant. You pray for God to open up the eyes of your heart. And you see that happening here. So it's both ways. He's praying for the Holy Spirit to come and to work amongst his people. And then praying for his people to have that spiritual yearning and sensitivity to pursue his leading. And to obey his conviction. And to trust his kindness as he leads them. So he prays for illumination, the ability to see, not just for the knowledge or the information of, here you go, here's more information about God. Here's more knowledge about God. And it's where when we're walking with God in the power of the Holy Spirit, that then the Bible comes alive. When we're seeking him with eyes that are open, rather than seeking him, desiring just to, you know, read our Bible and check it off. Or, just kind of do our bare minimum, but not really wanting to know more about God. Or, or just kind of seeing it as a chore, an obligation, rather than an opportunity to engage and to build a relationship with God. And so who does he flee to? The Father of glory, because he will, will all of these things in the life of his people. And he prays for the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, that's the difference between whether you take ownership of your faith, whether then you inherited your faith. And if you grew up here at FCBC Walnut, if we did our job, you inherited something. But it is up to each person to take ownership of your faith in that this is what matters to you, that God and his promises and his blessings are what you're pursuing, what you're living for, that your identity is found in Christ. And none of us We'll have it perfect in this lifetime, but it begins with God's work. It begins with the Holy Spirit in us, and it begins with our hearts being open to him. And so if you're sitting here and church has become nothing more than church or Christianity is because your family is, and that's just honestly who you are. And God knows, you know, your heart kind of God knows more. Then pray that pray for the Holy Spirit to open up your heart to him. And then don't just expect miracles to happen like that, but then return to his word. Go to his people, but pray for your heart to be open. Don't just pray for, oh, let me read more Bible today, and that's it. Or let me just wake up to go to church today. That's praying for the info. That's praying for the details. Pray for your relationship with God to come alive. And then trust him to do the rest, because a heart that is alive, that is beating, it will pump blood. And only God can make you come alive. And if you're praying desperately because that's what your heart desires, let's see what God does. But begin there. Pray for a relationship with God, not just knowledge about God. Because if you love God, you will care about the knowledge of God. But if you don't love God, or you're not seeking God, if the eyes of your heart are closed then you'll look elsewhere for that fulfillment, for that joy, for that identity. We're all the same in that way. So it's important to see how Paul prayed and realize that this is much more than just give me what I want, give me what I need, but it's a relationship with God. Well, let's go on. And in verse 18, what you'll find is a threefold prayer request. So Paul's asking for the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of his people, right? In three ways, you're going to find in the next section, 18 and 19. So let me go ahead and start reading here in 18. So what does he want them to know? With your eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. That's what... The Holy Spirit will reveal to his people, remind us of, and affirm 
truths in us through his word and through answer of prayer. So let's go and look at one thing at a time. So there's three things that Paul wants God's people to know, to be aware of, to be familiar with. Okay? The first one is that God has called us to a future hope. When you think about the word hope, what comes to your mind? I, I know what comes to my mind that it's kind of like a desire. It's kind of like a, a wish. But then when we talk about hope in a cultural way, it's like you don't really know what's going to happen. Like, I hope this will happen, but you don't know if it will. It's like dangling out of a request. It's dangling out of a desire. But you don't know who's going to grab it on the other side. And you don't really know if it's going to happen. So then you might have your dashed hopes, right? You might have your broken dreams. That's when it's dropped on the other side, I guess, or whatever it is. But then hope is like this kind of uncertain, you know, unfamiliar kind of like, oh, I'm not God, so I don't know kind of thing. But when the Bible talks about hope, it is not like that. When the Bible talks about hope, there's certainty behind it because the object of your hope is certain. I want to turn real quick to this passage from Romans 5. It addresses this topic of hope uh, in light of the gospel. So let me go and read it for us. It's on your screen as well. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is almost like the paraphrasing of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, except written to a different group of people, but by the same guy. Right? He's talking about the promises in Christ. He's talking about being saved and justified. He's talking about peace with God. He's talking about a relationship with God. He's talking about grace that comes through faith in what God has done. But then at the end of verse 2, they rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. With everything that came before that, does that hope seem uncertain to you? No, it's pretty certain because of what Jesus has done. It's pretty certain that where they're finding their joy in, it will happen. Whatever it is, is letting them sleep at night in deep spiritual rest, it will happen. That's how you can have joy. It's not true joy if you can't count on it. That's wishful thinking. That's an emotion. But this joy comes from this hope but then it's a hope in something that comes later of the glory of God speaks of when Christ returns. It's not now because this is what now looks like starting in verse three. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So this is biblical hope. Biblical hope is one that rises through trials and difficulties because it's the only thing that you're clinging on to. Biblical hope means you're in a storm and the only chance of survival you have is this rope that in the foggy night is hanging off some ship that you don't see but that's all you've got. And if you don't hold on to this, you will drown. But by faith, you believe that that ship is sturdy, that that ship is leading you back to shore, and that ship will hold that rope, and that rope will not snap. All of those things are what was described in Ephesians 1. Because God drives that ship because people are sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit so the rope will not break. And even though you may not see in the midst of trial who's on that ship, who's driving that ship, and who is on the other side of a fog, 
that hope that you have because of what you know is sure. You will get home. The boat will tug you back. You will get home. But see, this comes with perseverance. It comes with endurance and it comes with trials. You know where you don't find hope? Certainty. If you know exactly what's going to happen, you don't need to hope. That's foolishness. If what you know will happen is guaranteed, maybe you'll kind of act surprised at the moment. Oh, I got an A. I mean, you had an A already, so I got an A. But you knew it. You knew it like a week ago when your teacher told you, okay? Got an A. You don't need hope. But see, hope comes through persecution, through suffering, through trial. But then what does that mean? In that if God was to answer that prayer for his people, answering that prayer that will grow our hope in his promises, that means us clinging to his promises will lead to a life that is not easy. It will lead to a life that's not convenient, and it will lead to a life that requires and calls for perseverance. But the Holy Spirit has got us, and the Holy Spirit will lead us. God's word has been spoken. We know who he is through his word, and we know who wins at the end and what will happen and that God will come back for us, that Christ will have his bride and that the new heavens and the new earth will be the consummation of all of God's perfect plans and that his people will walk with him face to face forever. See, biblical hope looks to a final redemption, but it comes with this trust in who God is that has us sometimes limping along through this life but still having real hope that what he said will come to pass will come to pass so the first thing you need to know is that you're called to future hope which means that there's present suffering the second thing you're called to know is or he prays for you to know is that you are valuable to god You know, earlier it talks about how we have a spiritual inheritance and, you know, as sons and daughters of God, you know, in the new heavens and the earth, there's going to be wonderful things. Even as you look ahead in the New Testament, it speaks of all kinds of crowns for God's people. So God, in giving inheritance in the next life for eternity, he will richly bless his people in addition to their identity, in addition to who they are, in addition to being free from sin, all those ways. He will bless his people and he wants us to trust him with that. But here's the flip side of it. Have you ever thought about how God thinks of us? Well, this verse tells you that God sees his people as also his inheritance. So it's not like we just get his stuff. He's doing all of this so that he gets us. And you're like thinking, wow, does he really want this? But he does. He gets us. I mean, what are the things we want to inherit, right? Cars, money, a house, right? Um, Those things all perish. God wants us who will live forever with him. Now, he doesn't need us. He didn't need us in the beginning. But he wants us. We are his inheritance. And that leads to the third part is, well... How are we going to become what he's going to get? How are we going to be that bride that is on this side of heaven flawed in our sin, in our brokenness, in our struggles? But how are we going to become that beautiful bride that he speaks about in Ephesians 5, right? Jesus is washing his bride with his word and making her beautiful. How are we going to be that bride that when God comes back to get his church, that will be presentable to him? Well, that leads to the third thing that we should know is that he is powerful. The way that this verse describes Jesus' power, the way that this verse describes God's power, the way that this verse describes the Holy Spirit's power, it's like incomparable. It's like superlative. It's surpassingly amazing and great. That's how powerful God is. Which means, if God will get us as an inheritance, he's going to deliver 
and he's actually going to change us. A lot of times when we are struggling in our walks with God and in the sins that we have and in the issues that we have in our hearts of priorities and idols and treasures and everything else, you know who's the first to give up on us? It usually is us. We just kind of, you know what? I'm too bad. I, I can't control myself. I can't stay away from this temptation. I can't end this relationship. I can't commit to being faithful to God and how I live and my thoughts. You know who's the first to condemn us? Usually it's us. And Satan is very active in wanting to see that happen as well. Because we then are the, are the people that walk away from God and say, you know what? You're God, but I'm just not worthy of you. But God is more powerful than our sinfulness. And God is greater than our inability to be perfect and faithful and all put together. He's powerful. He can change hearts. He can make things happen. He can correct and turn and move people to where he wants them to be. I mean, why do we underestimate God when we just celebrated Easter? If the one who made the world can come into the world as a man, die on the cross and be raised back to life again, why would we doubt that God can do anything at all? See, we celebrate these things, but sometimes I wonder to what extent the eyes of our hearts are open to actually believe. Imagine how earth shouting it really would be if we believed any little bit of what we've come to know and be familiar with about the Easter story. Imagine if that came alive. So the passage then continues. And this last four verses is camping out on the power of God. In other words, in case you haven't heard enough to believe, Ephesians, of this great power, this majesty that comes from God, here are four ways in which Jesus, our glorious King, is powerful. And all of this is so cl closely connected to what we just celebrated a couple weeks ago that the timing could not be more perfect. So starting in verse 20, let me read this for us. Here is how God is mighty. Verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. God raised a dead person up into life. You know what doctors do and nurses do? Not that. They just slow it down. They don't resurrect people. The most trained doctors and nurses could never do what God has done and what he promises will do in the future. A resurrection of people physically from the dead. Now, Jesus did this, but that points to the fact that he's God, right? In his ministry. In the second half of verse 20, you see this. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So not only was Jesus raised from the dead, but Jesus is proclaimed and declared the greatest of all time. He's the goat. He is enshrined and enthroned right now at the right hand of God. But in that description, the idea is there is no one greater than Jesus. He is greater than any emperor, any king, any authority, any ruler, any enemy, and any friend. Jesus is greater. And he was enthroned and glorified by God. You know, interestingly enough, Jesus was crucified by the Roman Empire. And, and the prevailing understanding of the Roman Empire was this, was that there is no greater God than Caesar, than the emperor. He's eternal. In fact, the city of Rome, since first century BC, it was given like this nickname of the eternal city. That's Rome. So then when Paul throws this out and points to Jesus and says, Jesus in God's raising of him and glorifying of him is greater than anything that you call eternal in this life? Well, people didn't like that. But it also drew the contrast of 
how powerful Jesus is. Verse 21, the third thing. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He's universally the greatest. He is supreme. Okay, supreme. And then in verse 22, 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him all and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. So he's the greatest. Everyone's beneath him. And here's the kicker that you almost don't expect is that then God makes him the head of us. It was almost lining up until it got to that part. So, yeah, he's greater than emperors. That's great. He's greater than rulers. That's great. Everything's under his feet, of course. And he's now the head of us. And we're like looking at ourselves going, we're not so pretty. And he's the head? We're a reflection of the head. But now you see it all coming back together, don't you? Because we are God's inheritance. Jesus, who is mighty above all things and everyone, God put him as head of us. So who is in control and who is in charge of working in our lives personally and corporately to make us beautiful and acceptable and pure and righteous and loving and worshipful and kind before him, the head. And he is mighty and he is powerful to do it. You know, God putting Jesus' head over us is probably the greatest gift he could have given to the church. It's for our advantage. That's how this is phrased here, is that he's the head. Good for you. Good for you, God's people. Good for you, Ephesus. Good for you, church, that Christ is your head, because he will do mighty things, as he has already done mighty things. So everything comes full circle as we come to the end of Ephesians 1, from the beginning. So we see that God planned to save a people. We see that God sent Jesus to die for the sins of rebellious sinners like us. And then he puts them into the church. And we talked about this a few weeks ago as well, that it's not just your personal walk with God, but then God saves you to put you in a new family. God saves you because he's making a people for himself. And we see that connecting here too, is that we are his inheritance. We are his inheritance. God puts the most powerful king and exalted Lord as the head of the church over us. He fills the church. He works in the church. God gives the church then to himself as an inheritance. But meanwhile, as we're on earth, he extends his reign and he extends disciple making through his people until Christ returns. And then finally, Jesus will return for his church and be with her forever. This is God's plan, but this is God's blessing, and this is God's grace. And so when we hear this, and our hearts are, you know, kind of, you know, maybe even renewed again and refreshed again with some fluttering of gratitude, will be kind of like where Paul is then. Where we realize that it's all God, all grace, and it's all good because he is in control. So let me go ahead and pray for us. And then in your community groups, you're welcome to share on these, uh, but you're also welcome to talk about the things or follow up on what you started. But two questions. One is, how is your prayer life? I mean, what do you pray for? Because I think today's passage can touch on some of that. And it's not about, you know, oh, you know, right or wrong prayer in that sense. Because if your heart is seeking out, crying out to God, keep doing that. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. But sometimes I think as we walk with the Lord and we know him more, the ways in which you could pray, let's give that to him. Let's surrender to him what a thankful heart can ask for. And not just more of the same thing we're thankful for. But how can we pray and turn to God in a way that actually is about seeing his will 
and his goodness continue to work through us in the world? How can we pray for his glory to be stretched, to be experienced, to be evident in our lives and in the world? How can your heart be shaped in prayer, especially when you're grateful? The second question you can talk about is, what practical difference would it make if you understood that your hope is geared towards the future, but is certain as it deals with the struggles of this life? That the inheritance that you will receive also prepares you to be an inheritance for God, that someone's going to receive you. Your maker will receive you. And finally, if Jesus is this powerful, what can he do? How much do we underestimate our Lord? I mean, we could praise him, acknowledge him, that he could be raised from the dead. And, but really, in our lives, do we really believe he is powerful and he is good, that he can change people and circumstances and hearts? That he is worthy? That none of us are too bad to be more like Christ if we put our lives completely in his hands? That the brokenness that we experience, Christ can feel that and be better than that? Do we believe he's powerful? Because if we don't, then we can read the Bible, we can go to church that goes in one year, out the other, and then we go back out to our lives seeking for that thing that we hope with uncertainty would make life better. But everything that we need to hope for is in Christ. So let's pray. And then we'll break off in our community groups again. And let's talk some... Oh, one response song. And then we'll break off in the community groups again. Okay, let's pray. Now, Father, I just want to thank you, God, so much for all of these beautiful truths and promises. Things, Lord, that caught the Apostle Paul by pleasant surprise and brought about thanksgiving that led to fervent prayer. God, may we be renewed in our walks with you and our love for each other again because of what we know to be true about you, about Christ, about the gospel, and about the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to come alive in our walks with you personally and corporately and help us, Lord, to love each other and help us, Father, to be people that are not just willing to suffer, but also walk with others as they suffer. We thank you, Lord, that our future hope is assured because it is rooted in Christ and he is mighty and powerful and king. And he will come back for us and we will be with him forever if our faith is in him. So be with us, God, as we respond, as we sing, and be with us, Lord, as we share and as we care and as we pray for each other in our community groups. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.